Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Ashura is a very special time for the Muslims for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the day has tremendous uh, historical import in terms of the spiritual history of humanity and the spiritual history of the Muslim Ummah. So before uh, mentioning anything else, it's related to be the day that the children of, that the Ark of Noah Nuh salam settled on the Mount of Judi. Uh, so that day was the 10th of Muharram, Ashura, which is, whose name is derived from Ashara. So Ashura 10, Ashir 10th, Ashura, the 10th day of Muharram. It's the origin of the word. So the 10th of Muharram, the, the Ark of Nuh, Noah's Ark, alayhi salam, is related to have settled on the Mount of Judi. On the 10th of Muharram, Ashura, the Jews are related to have been delivered from bondage in Egypt. That was the day Fir'aun was drowned in the sea and the sea opened up for the Bani Israel and they left Egypt and Fir'aun and his army were drowned. So that's related on the day of Ashura. And those, those narrations are strong narrations, uh, weaker narrations that many scholars reject. Also mentioned this being the day uh, that, or, or it was before Islam, it was the day the Kaaba, the Kiswa was placed on the Kaaba, was on Ashura. So the, the cloth, which wasn't black always, <clears throat> it was different colors throughout history. In recent history, it's been black, but it was placed on the Kaaba on the 10th of Muharram. It's the day uh, Yunus is related. Many scholars reject this narration to have been expelled from the whale after he was taken into the belly of the whale. He was expelled on the 10th of Muharram. It's the day that uh, Yusuf alayhi salam was reunited with Yaqub, related. And again, these are weaker narrations. Uh, the day Ibrahim alayhi salam was saved from Nimrud or Nimrod was related to be the 10th of Muharram. So these are some uh, events that are associated with the day. So it's a day of great spiritual import. Some relate that the Arabs used to fast <clears throat> the 10th of Muharram, Ashura. And so the Muslims got the custom from the Arabs, but the stronger narration is that when the Muslims attained to Medina, the Jews celebrated the day uh, and fasted it as a day, as we mentioned, when uh, Moses, Musa alayhi salam, and the children of Israel, 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 were delivered from bondage in Egypt. And so it was a day that the Jews fasted and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, we have more right to Moses. So he ordered the believers to fast that day. And so for one year, Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, was the obligatory fast for the Muslims. The next year, uh, <clears throat> Ramadan was uh, incumbated as the obligatory fast. And at that point, after one year being obligatory, Ashura, fasting Ashura became voluntary. And so it's sunnah to fast on that day. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned one should fast the day before or the day after to distinguish this ummah from the practice of the Jews. So, so those are some uh, significances, significance given to the day uh, before Islam and then during the prophetic period, the fasting of that day obligatorily for one year and then voluntarily throughout the entirety of the prophetic period. Afterwards in the year 61, a famous event occurred, which was the martyrdom of Hussein, anhu, 
and 20 members of his family, along with 52 other individuals who were in his party. They were martyred at Karbala. <clears throat> so we talk about that briefly, inshallah ta'ala. So when uh, Muawiyah was on his deathbed, close to death, radiallahu anhu, and we should have a good opinion of Muawiyah. Muawiyah ascended the Khilafah after Hassan bin Ali uh, abdicated and turned over the leadership of the a community to Muawiyah. Muawiyah was one of the companions who was a recorder of the Wahi, min Kutab al Wahi, one of the scribes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many hadith related uh, by Muawiyah, perhaps the most notable one on Muawiyah ta radiallahu anhu, qal, qal Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, man yurid Allahu bihi khayran yufakihu fi al-din. وإنما أنا قاسم والله عز وجل يعطي ولن تزال طائفة من هذه الأمة قائمة بأمر الله لا يضرهم من خالفهم حتى يأتي أمر الله حديث متفق عليه يعني رواه رواه البخاري ومسلم. So this hadith related by Muawiyah relates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on the Messenger of Allah that he said, one Allah desires good for, he gives him or her a sound understanding of the religion, you faqih of fiddin. At that point, fiqh was not the developed science of jurisprudence, so the linguistic me meaning of faham, fiqh, faham. So Allah gives them a sound understanding of the religion. Uh, and verily, I am the one who dispenses the revelation in the Ma'ana Qasim. So the Prophet ﷺ dispenses the revelation like seeds. Sometimes it falls on fertile ground and the seeds take root and it brings forth lush vegetation. People eat from it, cattle eat from it, it benefits people. Sometimes it falls on porous ground. It doesn't bring forth vegetation, but the water is stored up in the earth and people irrigate their crops and they draw water from their wells and it benefits people, and that way, sometimes it falls on rock, and it doesn't take root, nor does it sink in, so that it's stored up. And this is mentioned in another hadith. And so, thus a human heart. Some hearts are fertile, they receive the revelation, it brings forth a lush, spiritual life. Some hearts, they store the revelation, and it benefits them subsequently and some hearts are hard. So Allah mentions in the Quran the hardness of the heart, of the hearts, and they can be harder than rock. So those hearts are like rocks even more intensely hard. And meaning some rocks give benefit, right? We have rocks that we build our houses from, we pave our streets with, we, we can make a pumice uh, skin scraper or whatever you will call it. Some rocks give benefit. A hard heart gives no benefit. And so this is why it's even harder than rocks. Because some rocks give benefit, but rock-like hearts, they do not convey or give any benefit. In any case, <clears throat> So Muawiyah, radiallahu an, he ascends the Khilafah when Al Hassan uh, abdicates in his favor. Why? To establish peace and a an extended period of peace uh, in, 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 in ensued. And during that period, the Ummah expanded, uh, perhaps like no other time. Exhibitions were sent to the east and the west, the realm of the Muslims expanded and throughout most of that uh, period peace prevailed. However, when Muawiyah was passing, he appointed his son Yazid to the Khilafah. And this was incongruous with the way the Sunnis had settled on, the consensus of the community and the shura of the community choosing the leader of the community nor the Shi'i, the Shia, 
which the community should be headed by one of the male descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through his daughter Fatima. That's their, their belief. And they're critics of that belief. Primarily that if Allah intended for the, the leader of the community to be a direct blood descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would have kept his sons alive so that Mel, uh, that, that successorship would have been direct and not indirect through his daughter, but then his cousin, Ali. But that's, that's a debate, beyond the scope of what we're here for. So in any case, when Yazid was appointed, and it's related, I'm not going to mention some of the things in terms of some moral failings attributed to Yazid, because I don't think that's profitable, nor do I want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having in any way, shape, or form passed any judgment on, on people we should pray for their forgiveness. In any case, uh, there were moral failings that were attributed to Yazid that many Muslims, not just uh, al Hussein, but many others deemed to be totally incompatible with the prophetic path and the prophetic model. And that our model in all things is the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرُ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا So you have in the Messenger of Allah most excellent an example for any who looks forward to success on the last day, uh, who looks forward to meeting Allah on the last day and remembers Allah abundantly. <coughs> So Al Hussein and and others, but particularly Al Hussein, he refused to give bayah, to give an oath of allegiance to Yasid. That being the case, he knew that his life was in danger. So he gathered uh, members of his family, his immediately fa immediate family, uh, some of the children of his brother Hassan, and other relatives along with several, uh, many others, so their number's about 72 total, uh, give or take. And they, they set out from Mecca to take sanctuary in the house of Allah. So, while they were en route, the people of Kufa, who had betrayed Hussein's father, Imam Ali, leading to his, his assassination. They had also refused to give uh, bayah to uh, Yazid. And they sent word to Hussein that they, if he came to them, they would support him as the Khalifa and they would give their oath of allegiance to him. And so Hussein, remembering what happened to his father, <clears throat> He didn't respond to them immediately. He sent his cousin, Muslim bin Aqil, bin Abi Talib, to go to Kufa to investigate the situation. So when Muslim bin Aqil arrived in Kufa, radiallahu anhu, rahimahullah, when he arrived in Kufa, initially the people were very supportive. So all of the major chiefs of the various tribes there, 18,000 people, is related, uh, gave bayah to Hussein and uh, informed their, their, uh, his uh, uh, envoy, his, um, his ambassador or emissary, that they would support him if he came. So uh, uh, Muslim bin Aqil wrote a letter which he sent to Hussein telling him the situation was good, the people were supportive, they were loyal, they were prepared to help him, and he dispatched the letter. Uh, during this time, uh, Yazid, hearing that the people of Kufa were refusing to give the bayah and they were contemplating bringing Hussein uh, to be their, the imam, he sent uh, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad as the governor 
to govern Iraq <clears throat> and to force the people to take Bayah. So Obeidullah bin Ziyad, he sent a, a disputed, a di di dispatched or commissioned a general Omar bin Saad to lead an army. And the army was composed of the people of Kufa. He also killed uh, uh, Muslim bin Akil. So he killed Imam Hussein's envoy after he had dispatched the letter. <clears throat> They began to persecute the people of Kufa, and once again, they were treacherous. So many of them joined the army of Umar bin Saad and broke their commitment, refused to go forward with their commitment to support Hussein. Hussein, in the meantime, had received a letter from Muslim bin Akil, and he set out, changed course from Mecca to Iraq to Kufa. Many of the companions tried to dissuade him. Uh, most prominently, Ibn Abbas. So Ibn Abbas, his cousin, urged him and pleaded with him not to go, that these people were treacherous, that they wouldn't support him, they would betray him as they betrayed his father. Ibn Umar was another who beseeched and pleaded with Imam Hussein not to go, uh, and many, many others. But Hussein was convinced that this was his destiny, that the people would indeed, once he arrived, they would prove to be loyal. So he set out for Iraq. En route, he encountered the army of Umar bin Saad, who were composed primarily of the people of Kufa. <clears throat> and he said to them, if you're prepared to assist me, I will go forward. If not, I will turn back. I will go back and continue on to Mecca. They said, proceed to Kufa, but from another route. And in reality, they were leading Hussein and his party to Karbala. Karbala was a place where, which didn't have direct and immediate access to the water of the Euphrates River. And so they were putting them in a place where they wouldn't have water. So they were essentially sending them to their doom. And at Karbala, Umar bin Saad uh, offered Hussein to take Bayah again. Hussein refused and the Battle of Karbala ensued Hussein's uh, troop, although severely outnumbered, uh, fought the entire day until finally after fighting all day, uh, most of them were killed. Uh, the only male that survived was Zainul Abidin. Zainul Abidin survived because he was sick and couldn't leave the tent. And the women, uh, after being stripped of their jewelry, were sent to Damascus. At the head of the women was Zainab, Imam Hussein's sister. Uh, and here there are details I don't want to get into, but they challenge some of the uh, uh, aspects of the story, to put it that way, in terms of did Yazid order directly this massacre? Remember, Yazid was removed in the sense that it was Yazid and then his governor, uh, Obeidullah bin Ziyad, and then his general, Omar bin Saad. And so there, there are different uh, arguments that are made that Yazid did not order the massacre. Allahu alam. Uh, I wasn't there, so I can't tell you from my personal experience what happened. Uh, but there are certain lessons we can take. So you can you can delve into the details, but as Allah mentions in the Quran, talking about the earlier ummas, so it's not directly applicable, but by indication we can draw uh, uh, the meaning. So Allah Taala. Mentions twice, 
لها ما كسبت ولكم ما كسبتم ولا تسألون عما كانوا يعملون that this is a community that has passed away this is those are earlier people from this community so as i said not a different ummah al ummah al islamiyah al muhammadiyah but they've passed away and what is relevant laha ma kasabat they will have what they earned walakum ma kasabtum and you will have what you earned uh, and you won't be asked about what they did. So Yom Al Qiyama, Allah Taala is going to ask us who was right, Muawiyah or Hussein, or or Yazid or Hussein. Allah is going to ask us is not going to ask us what really happened at Karbala. We might ask Allah if we could stop sweating long enough to. But we're not going to be asked about any of this. We're going to be asked about what we did. And a lot of times we, we jump into these historical arguments without even knowing the full facts. So, for example, uh, a lot of people argue that Muawiyah, Yazid, this is all an extension of a conspiracy of uh, Bani Umayyah to take over the Ummah and it started with Abu Sufyan. And then they'll have a really bad opinion of Abu Sufyan. But they won't even know what happened with Abu Sufyan. What happened with Abu Sufyan? Yeah, he was the leader of Mecca, one of their leaders. He commissioned the armies that were trying to destroy Islam. That's true. But what happened once he took Shahada? And people don't know. What happened is he lost both of his eyes fighting jihad under the commanders from the other companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi That's what that was his fate. And so a person who probably doesn't even get out of bed to pray Fajr is uh, Abu Sufyan, Banu Umayyah. And Abu Sufyan put his life on the line for this ummah once he committed to it. So what he, yeah, he was terrible before he took shahada. And then both of his eyes were gouged out fighting on the battlefield at uh, Yarmouk. Allahu Musta'an. In any case, so I think what's more important for us uh, are the lessons we can extract from the story as opposed to the blow-by-blow -blow details of the story. And then so after uh, the women and Zainul Abidin were taken to Damascus with Hussein's severed head, radiallahu anhum ajma'in, uh, after a while they were sent back with an armed escort back to Medina. And uh, they lived out their days as uh, Zainul uh, Abidin in, in Medina, and Zainab returned with him uh, at that point. So the details, as I said, can delve, delve into them, or we can try to take lessons. So the, the first lesson I already mentioned is that these are not events we should pass judgment concerning because they, they, they won't advance us and they might set us back. They won't advance us in the sense that no matter what side we take or who we think or believe was right, it's not going to uh, affect our standing with Allah in any way. Then it might set us back because it, it might uh, draw us into the, these partisan conflicts which didn't even exist at the time of Karbala. So I'll give you a couple examples, things probably no one ever told you because they want you to be divided. So the, the roots of this uh, event in a certain sense could said to be rooted in the assassination of Uthman radiallahu anhu. 
Zundur Rain, the possessor of the two lights, the two lights being the two daughters of the Prophet, وسلم, that the Prophet gave earth men to marry. And, if, and the Prophet said, what if he had another daughter available? He would have given her to earth men. <coughs> the last guards at the door of earth men, when the rebels descended on his house, and this is something discussed in, uh, by Ibn al-Arabi in uh, Awasim and Qawasim, wa al-Hassan and Hussein. They were guarding Uthman's door. One of the last people to leave Uthman was Imam Ali. Radiallahu anhu. Two of the sons of Hussein who were killed at Karbala, Ali Bayt, sons of Hussein's, grandsons of Ali, Great grandsons of the of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam through Fatima, their names were Uthman and Abu Bakr bin Hussein. Uthman and Abu Bakr bin Al Hussein. You don't name your children after people you hate. So those theological differences develop much later. There was a partisan felt Ali should have been Khalifa. That was their feeling, but that didn't manifest in any theological beliefs. That didn't manifest in passion plays and people beating themselves, commemorating the death of the leader of their faction. One of Hassan's sons who was with Hussein was also killed at Karbala, was also named Abu Bakr. Radiallahu anhu. So we can be drawn into a conflict that didn't even exist at the time of these events. So we think this is some schism between uh, the Shia and the Sunnis that didn't even exist. There was only the, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These theological splits came much later. Now you could say the roots were there, but the actual theological differences, they didn't exist. And so we shouldn't be drawn into a conflict that didn't even exist at the time of the people, the conflict is oftentimes attributed to. <coughs> Yes, there were political differences, but there weren't theological differences. And there weren't these deep hatreds. As I said, you don't, you don't name your children after people you hate. You don't marry people you hate. Imam Ali married one of Omar's daughters. So we, we should be cognizant of this. Tilka al-ummah qad khalat laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabtum wa la tusalun amma kanu ya'manun. This is a, a people that passed away. They will have what they earned. You will have what you earned. And you won't be asked about what they were doing. Uh, the, the second thing. I can't see with my new glasses. I can't see without them. Uh, in these days and times, when we see the instruction of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, violated with impunity. What instruction was that? The, the hadith where he lays out Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam many of the duties of Muslim brotherhood or sisterhood. He says لا تحاسدوا ولا تناجشوا ولا تباغدوا ولا تدابروا But the, the one want to emphasize لا تباغدوا Don't hate one another. Don't hate one another. And so those people slaughtered Hussein, they, they hated him. Or they, you can't do that. You can't treat people that you don't hate. Like one of the things that, that uh, war does, it dehumanizes. <laughs> I wonder what these are, reading glasses. <laughs> it's not that bad, people. <laughs> I just pick up the notebook. It's all good. Uh, <clears throat> I 
Hatred is something spread by shaitan. إنما يريد الشيطان أن يوقع بينكم العداوة والبغضاء. Shaitan wants to instill enmity and hatred amongst you. It's not something that Allah desires. إنما المؤمنون إخوة. The believers are brothers. إنما المؤمنين إخوة. أذلة على المؤمنين. عزة على الكافرين. They're they're gentle. In their dealings and treatment of the believers, this is the characteristic of of the believers. So, hatred is from shaitan, and so when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, "Don't hate one another," he's saying essentially, "Don't take on this satanic characteristic, because if you do, shaitan will manipulate you, and you do terrible things." Such as what happened at Karbala, such as what's happening today in so many parts of this Ummah. You know what's happening in Yemen. You know Muslims bombing and brutalizing each other. Total disregard to the civilian population. Total disregard to the fate of the children. لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَا يَرْحَمْ مَنْ لَا يَرْحَمْ صَغِيرَنَا He's not from us who doesn't have mercy to our young people. The children are most of those million people suffering from cholera in Yemen. What's happening in Somalia? What's happening in Iraq, Afghanistan? What's happening and has happened in Syria? These are Muslims doing this to each other, and America supplies the weapons to all sides and laughs all the way to the bank, with the exception of the Syrian government. The Russians supply them. But Iraq, America pl- supplies the Iraqi central government. America supplies Daesh through Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. And they're funneling weapons to ISIS. ISIS had an American arsenal. America supplies the Kurds and let them all kill each other and just resupply and laugh all the way to the bank. So. We have to remove that element of hatred, and so by opposing implication, you have to love one another. لن تدخل الجنة حتى تؤمن ولا تؤمن حتى تحبو. You won't enter paradise until you believe, truly believe, and you will not truly believe until you love one another. <clears throat> and so, these are the best of people. And they can be they can be set against each other by shaitan. So why did this happen? It happened as a lesson or a warning to us. If this can happen to the best of people, what can happen to us if we're not careful? Yemen can happen to us. Syria can happen to us. Iraq can happen to us. Somalia can happen to us. Afghanistan can happen to us. It can happen to the best of people. Then, if we're not careful, it can happen to us. So, how do we prevent it? We have to make an a priori commitment, like a, a, a pre-standing commitment, that we're not going to kill a Muslim. Nor any other innocent person, but with a special emphasis on a Muslim, and we're going to take serious the warnings against that, such as the Prophet saying, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, man aan ala qatli mu'minin walo bi shatri kalima yalqa 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 Allah yom al qiyamati maktubun bain aynehi ayisun min rahmatillah." Whoever aids and assists. In killing a believer, even by uttering half a word, walo bi shatri kalima, will meet Allah on the day of judgment written across their forehead. I've despaired of Allah's mercy. Ayyusum rahmatillah. Wala qatli raj wala qatlu rajal mu'min a'zmu inda Allahi min zawal dunya. To kill a single believer is graver with Allah than effacing the entire earth, than wiping out the entire earth. 
We have to take these things seriously. Otherwise, we'll see these tragedies repeated. And we're not immune. We'll see our communities torn apart. So this is a lesson that we can, we can take from this uh, situation. Another lesson, and this is a lesson uh, we can take from Hussein's action. And no one can argue that Hussein went, went against the principle of Adam al khuruj al al-Hakim. Those principles, as we mentioned in terms of the theology that justifies these various positions, those principles hadn't been derived yet, number one. <coughs> and <coughs> secondly, Muawiyah was not following the prescribed methods of succession. And so no one can fault Hussein in that sense. But what we can learn from Hussein is that there are things worth dying for. He knew he was going to his death. But he also knew he was keeping certain principles alive. And those principles relate to just leadership for this ummah. And even if the principle remains aspirational, one day that aspiration becomes the foundation of implementation. If you see something wrong, change it with your hand. If you can't change it with his hand, with his tongue. So Hussein knew he couldn't uh, undo the rule of Yazid with his hand, with 72 people, many of them women and children. And he knew that he couldn't do it with his tongue. But he, he maintained the belief in his heart that this principle of just and legitimate rule would endure in this ummah. <coughs> and so he died for that. And Dr. King said, a man who has nothing to die for doesn't deserve to live. Or some along to paraphrase him. Or is not fit to live. So we, we should be willing to die for this deen. Like now people are upset and scared. What are you scared of? The people look at us funny and MashaAllah. We send you to Palestine, you give more than a nasty look. Or to some of these places we mentioned. And so just what? Just compromise your religion. Oh, they don't like this, they don't like that. I'll get rid of this, I'll get rid of that, I'll get rid of this, I'll get rid of that. To there's no there's no dean left. Saying, I'm not getting rid of anything. Just kill me. Now, I'm not saying, <laughs> I just said it. <laughs> but if you don't have anything to die for, there's nothing worth living for. This deen is more precious than our life. Maqas is sharia. One of the maqas, and they're prioritized. Number one, hifzul deen. And then hifzul hayat, hifzul aql, hifzul nasal. Deen is number one because if you don't have deen, this life, there's nothing. About, what does living mean? When we were created to worship Allah, and there's no deen, there's no worship of Allah. I've only created the jinn and human that they worship me. That's number one priority. That's number one priority, meaning what? We give our life for this thing. So I'm not saying go out and do something stupid, but if someone does something stupid to you, you're a shaheed. So we, we, have to, we have to look at the example of the likes of Al Hussein. Outnumbered, 
overwhelmed, but still willing to die for a principle. Malcolm knew he was going to die. Malcolm knew he was going to die. And there were people who wanted to save Malcolm. They, were, they wanted Malcolm to come to Africa. Just come to Africa. we we'll set you up in Ghana. Set you up in West Africa. Let this all, let this, everything calm down. Then you go back. He said, no. He knew, he knew he was going to die. Right? He told the guards, don't frisk today. Like, what? Just don't. But he understood something. He understood that if he died for a principle, and if he died for his belief, and if he died courageously, he would inspire millions of people after him. He's moved more people in his death than he did in his life. At the end, how many people with Malcolm? At the end. Now, millions of people met his autobiography, black, white. You have a lot of people, not even African-American. Dr. Omar, for example, became a Muslim because of Malcolm X. And millions of others all over this world. So this is something that we can take uh, from Hussein. Min al-mu'mineen, rijalun sadaqu ma ahadu Allah alayhi. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نِحْبَهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرُ وَمَا بَدِّلُوا وَمَا بَدِّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا Amongst the believers, there are men who are truth, truthful in the covenant they've convened with Allah. Amongst them are those who have given their lives. And amongst them are those who are waiting their turn. They never weakened in their resolve. وَمَا بَدِّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا And so... We thank Allah for, for people like Hussein who show us that sometimes you just have to risk the overwhelming odds, even if it means your life, because there are things more valuable to us than our life. And our deen should be more valuable than our life. So again, I'm not saying do something stupid, go be foolhardy, uh, I'm Muslim, I don't care. No. But we stand up, we stand proud, we stand as descendants, spiritual descendants of Hussein and spiritual children of Malcolm X, and we courageously practice our religion. And if we can't do that, then we make hijrah. We don't just throw our religion away, compromise our religion, because Yom al Qiyamah, Allah is not going to ask us, uh, why, did, why did you stay and just compromise your religion until it wasn't recognizable? Allah is going to ask us what He asked us in the Quran. Was not Allah's earth spacious? Migrate in it. Go somewhere else where you can practice your religion. If you're uncomfortable with people looking at you funny. Or whispering, oh, they're, they're one of them. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they wear the rags on the head like that. <laughs> they're talking about me. Go somewhere else. It might be in America. Move to Philly. You'll be fine. Seriously, you don't even have to leave the country. Just move to Philly or move to Newark. You're straight. Let everyone be a slave of Islam, brother. <laughs> you don't even have to leave the country. I'm serious. But Allah's earth is spacious. Don't stay somewhere where people don't like you or you're not comfortable. Go to where you're comfortable and can be a Muslim. Don't just stop being a Muslim. Then blame it on your English professor. <laughs> I don't know if I believe anymore. My belief was deconstructed. But, but really, I'm scared. That's a convenient excuse. May Allah protect us and help us. Uh, another lesson is honoring the family of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The family of the Prophet were dishonored.
and Karbala. They were dishonored. The, what, what happened was a, a crime against the family of the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his grandchildren and great grandchildren were slaughtered and murdered after being betrayed and then set up. We have an obligation to honor the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that's part of our faith. That's part of our faith. It's not about being a Shi, it's about our faith, our belief. This is from the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Just to let you know, this is being broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. All right. So we can forge on. This is what we need to hear. We just tell people, oh, go hide, Muslims. Go hide. Uh, or Hussein died for nothing. Is there's no example for us in that? There's examples for us. I said we're not talking about doing something crazy or ridiculous. We're not talking about killing people. We're talking about being prepared to give our lives, to have our lives taken, standing up for living and defending what we believe in. And if someone does something, we're shaheeds. That's part of our religion. And that's what Hussein taught us. That's what Malcolm taught us. That's what we should be teaching each other. And this would be a better place. The, 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 one of the, the, the pathetic aspects of this country is a, a refusal to deal with reality. It's never dealt with the reality of slavery. It's never dealt with the reality of the genocide against the native people. It doesn't deal with the reality of what happens when you dedicate $700 billion a year to making weapons of mass destruction and you have to deplete your inventories. What's, what's the consequence of that? The country's never come to grips with it. So if, if anything that we as a Muslim community can do is to make them come to grips with it. And if they want to put us and lock us away or something, good luck. But how long are we going to perpetuate the pathetic nature of this country? Look at North Carolina right now. People who are, who, whose health has been destroyed because they're living next to these pig farms. Thousands of pig farms where they're, they're too cheap to process the waste they're pumping in these lagoons and before the storm spraying in the open air in primary African-American communities, people's houses are coated with this salmonella and E. coli. They're getting sick and they, they, they refuse to pass a law to even give relief to people who are suffering from that. And now the hurricane and all that stuff's in the water. And they're trying to... Uh, just, just dismiss it, sweep it under the rug. We shouldn't sweep anything under the rug. It's a day, it's time for reckoning for this country. It's time to come to grips with a history of genocide and a history of white supremacy and a history of institutionalized racism and a history of hypocrisy and double standards. And if they don't want to hear it, too bad. Throw me in jail. I don't care. <laughs> That's, that's why Hussein died. And that's why Malcolm died. And so these commemorations, they're not jokes. Just come eat some food and kiss each other and go home. We have to take lessons. Otherwise, we wonder why children running away from Islam. Because we don't tell them the truth. And because we don't tell them the truth, they become vulnerable to other people's lies. We have to tell the truth. Prophets told the truth. We're supposed to be the heirs of the prophets. 
Uh, the, the people in power hated the prophets. That's the reality. So if they hate us, we're in good company. As long as we're right. As long as we're right. As long as we're not encouraging people to do irrational things. We're not saying anything irrational. Right? A Christian would say, I'm ready to die for Christ. Right or wrong? So a Muslim can't say, I'm prepared to die for my religion. I'm not saying fighting anybody. I'm prepared to live my religion as a free human being in the United States of America. And if someone doesn't like it and they said we're going to kill that person, then I'll be a shaheed. Halas. What was anti-American about that? And if, if I do it, maybe I can help alleviate some of the problems that are destroying this country. Things are good out there. Opiate crisis, suicide crisis, alcohol crisis, truth crisis. A crisis of truth. As we said, why? Because we've been lying to each other for too long. It has to stop somewhere with somebody. So why not right now with us? May Allah give us tawfiq. We have to reverence the, the, the family of the prophets, alayhim as -salam. We have to reverence them. We have to reverence them. They are, are, are our spiritual mothers and grandmothers, rather, and grandfathers. They are the, 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 the descendants and the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah give us tawfiq. May Allah give us taysir. May Allah give us kabul. La illallah. Ya ayyuhal nas, taraktu fikum, man aqaftum. Ma tadillu baadi. Ma in aqaftumuhu lan tadillu baadi. Kitab Allahi wa itrati. Oh, people, I've left you two things. If you adhere to him, the two of them, you won't go straight after me, the book of Allah and my family. And وَإِطْرَتِي meaning to cling to them. If you take them, if you love them, if you love them, you won't go astray body after me. And so as I said, that hatred was there. So may Allah give us tawfiq. May Allah bless us. Uh, on, on this occasion May Allah give us a sense of uh, Spiritual duty Like we're not just feathers floating in the breeze Like we say heirs of the prophet The prophetic legacy is under attack today Like no other time in human history Like the prophetic legacy concerning Very basic things Well they said The male is in no wise like the female it's under attack. It's under attack in terms of faith. Our minds, many people, Muslims, minds have been totally secularized. Secularized meaning there's no concept of the akhirah because there's no concept of the of the akhirah. There's there's no sense that there's life beyond this world. So if I don't jump on every bandwagon that comes along, if I don't engage in every fad that comes along, I'm not missing anything because this world passes. Every day, someone we know is passing on. It's the law of averages. The longer we stay around, the more people we know are going to move on. And then it's our turn. And then we're gone. And then what? You think it's all over at that point? You think it's all over at that point? As the song says, you've only just begun to live. So much in life ahead. The life of the akhirah. And that's what we're preparing for. This isn't an end. This is an end for people with no faith. We jump on their bandwagon, it becomes our end. And we start advocating for what they advocate. We start following what they put out there for us to follow. We become consumed by the fads consuming them. 
Their suicide rates go up, Muslim suicide rates go up. Their drug addiction rates go up, Muslim drug addiction rates go up. They start wearing their pants hanging off their rear end, Muslim start wearing their pants hanging off their rear end. Whatever they do, we do. Why? Because there's no sense that we're different. There's no sense that we have a destiny beyond this world and its fads and its, its fakiness and its falsities. So we have to cultivate that sense. If we don't talk about it, for starters, how, how are we going to cultivate it? How are we going to cultivate it? We have to talk about it. We have to be honest with each other. We have to be open with each other. And some people won't like it, but believe me, a whole lot of people will. Because a lot of people out there are fed up. And a lot of people are, are, are looking for solutions that transcend the current options. Right? You don't like the way things is? Vote for the party not in power. They go back and forth. The Democrats, the Republicans. Democrats, the Republicans. So you don't like Trump? Vote for the Democrats. Then uh, before that, you don't like Bush? Vote for Obama. You don't like Obama? Vote for Trump. You don't like Trump? Vote for whoever they put out there in 2020 and go back and forth. That's not solving the problem. That's playing games. And so people are looking for viable solutions. That's why they, they get drawn in to the slogans. They believe, okay, there's some hope now. They believe there's going to be some greatness. There will be greatness for this country, inshallah ta'ala. But that greatness will only come when we stop dehumanizing each other, when we stop praying, spraying pig feces on people who don't look like us, when we stop uh, blocking laws that will give those people some relief because it will cost some corporations some money, when we stop making uh, uh, voter suppression laws that the, the Supreme Court of North Carolina says were constructed with, with racial precision to discriminate against uh, certain races of people. When we stop that, there'll be greatness. Until, until then, there'll be tribulation. There'll be deeper cleavages between us. There'll be more intense uh, uh, in, uh, further increases in the incivility that qualifies our political discourse. And if you like that, then say we're good with the status quo. If you don't like that, start telling the truth to people. If you don't like that, start standing up and representing within yourself an alternative, right? Hussein stood up. And he represented an alternative. You don't have to have Yazid. I'll stand up and I'll try to represent these people. And they betrayed him. But that's their problem, not his problem. Because 1,500 years later, 1,400 some odd years later, we're still talking about Hussein. We're still gathering to commemorate, commemorate Hussein. Who's talking about those people who opposed him? Who knows the name before tonight of uh, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, Omar bin Saad? Who knows those names? But Hussein is on every one of our tongues. His example inspires each and every one of us. And that's what it's all why, because he took a truthful stand and he defended his principles. And that's all, that's all anyone could ask for. That's all I'm saying. So if someone wants to twist what I'm saying and say, oh, you're, you're making veiled suggestions of Muslims to take jihad and start killing people and blah, blah, blah. Well, you could twist and lie and distort. I'll tell you straight up what I'm saying. We have to be true to what we believe in and we have to be, be willing to give our life for it. And we have to, and if, if you think that's some radical statement from the Quran, I'll, I'll give you the exact quote from Dr. King. A man who does not have something uh, for which he is willing to die is not fit to live. 
That's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a Christian pacifist. So that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about fighting anyone, but we're talking about standing up and defending our dignity, standing up and representing and defending our religion, which has helped us. And for many of us, Islam saved my life. Islam saved my life. I'm, I'm not going to tell people about it. When they're suffering from the same thing I was suffering from before I became a Muslim, that, that would be treachery on my part. That would be cowardice. It would be treachery. It would be, it would be a betrayal of the gift that Allah gave me. So that's what Hussein was all about. That's what Malcolm was all about. That's what Dr. King was all about. And that's what we should be about as a community. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq. May Allah give us success in our affairs. <laughs> he said, you're not coming back for Ashra next year. <laughs> if you do, we're not going to live stream it. <laughs> May Allah give, give everyone tawfiq. May Allah bless the community. May Allah bless the community. May Allah bless our sisters. May Allah give them strength. May Allah give them greater courage. May Allah make them an example for all of us. May Allah Ta'ala bless the brothers, bless our children. May Allah spare them from the bullying and the racism. And may it come to an end in our lifetime. But it's not coming to an end by just tiptoeing around it. May Allah bless us to be part of that solution. May Allah bless us to help save this country. May Allah help us to be people who believe and exemplify civil discourse. May Allah bless us, Tyler, bless us to be people that respect the blessings of pluralism and to respect those. May Allah bless, help us to appreciate the blessings of safety and security. We gather in safety and security. May Allah extend those blessings. May Allah deepen those blessings. May Allah bless us to give thanks for those blessings. If you give thanks, I will increase you in my blessings. If you give thanks for my blessings, I will increase you in those blessings. And if you reject my blessings, you should know that my punishment is severe. The greater one of the greatest blessings we enjoy is the blessing of security. The one who has driven off hunger from, from them and made them, uh, given them uh, safety from fear. So may Allah give us gratitude for the blessings of security.